with uh, Oliver Hunking and uh, Peter Götz. We would like to talk about DevOps and legacy with you. And uh, perhaps before we, before we start uh, talking about legacy and uh, DevOps, uh, short introduction who we are. Uh, so uh, I'm doing Scrum and DevOps trainings and also a lot of uh, consulting uh, and uh, was, I was a developer and later went on to operations and so uh, DevOps is my uh, thing. And yeah, I'm a, so I'm a software developer uh, by heart, um, and I am uh, started with Scrum in uh, 20 or whatever, um, and I'm doing that for the for the last 12, 13 years. The first and question that we have is, um, uh, what what is legacy? And since we, we we know quite a lot about DevOps, but we have no clue about legacy, so um, maybe you can help us out. What is legacy? Legacy code is code without tests. Okay, cool. What else? Anything else? Waterfall. Okay. So, uh, so, so code developed in a waterfall way? Is that it? Uh -huh. What else? Everything in the code base that I didn't write. Exactly. <laughs> um, or maybe we would be good pair programmers, everything that we didn't write, because I see lots of legacy as well. Uh, what else is legacy? No automation installation. Exactly, no automation. So maybe to summarize, um, legacy, the way we understand it, is um, code that's hard to maintain because it has grown over time. Is, um, it has some aspects of technical debt, right? Yes, uh, code that we are basically afraid of touching and that, that we can't really uh, work with anymore because it's in a bad state. And obviously, we, we didn't write it, we just inherited it, and so it's legacy. So the question now is... Um, next. Uh, wh why would we do, uh, why would we try, uh, or want to do uh, DevOps, whatever that is, and we will talk about this. And the first uh, answer for me is, I don't want to be afraid, uh, uh, not only in the dark, but also I don't want to be afraid f uh, of the next uh, deployment that could happen three months from now, and I'm already af uh, afraid and having sleepless nights. Uh, I want a deployment to be a non-event, basically, that just happens. And uh, me as a developer, I've never been in the ops uh, situation um, in, a, um, in a real environment. Um, as a developer, I know these nights, yeah? lying in bed um, uh, in my IDE, writing code, or being late in the office. This is the stuff that I want to avoid because the code is usually not the best one that we write in that situation. And when we were uh, young and uh, started fresh, we were quite proud of uh, doing all-nighters and uh, this was, okay, we are real developers, we didn't sleep this night. And basically it's crap that we did back then. Next thing is, I don't want to be a firefighter all the time. I want my systems to run and to reliably run and not me being woken up again at uh, 3 a.m. Seemingly uh, sleep is something Peter and I value very much. I don't want to be woken up for a server that crashes, I want my systems to be reliable. And for me, um, I would like to be a doctor in real life. I would like to uh, do surgery. No, that's a joke. Um, I would like to uh, be able to look into the systems. So um, as a developer, we are used to um, develop this stuff because we know how it works. We usually do not know how it behaves in production. And um, as developers and as uh, per people who operate stuff, we need to do that. We need to be able to do that. All of these reasons are reasons for DevOps. Whatever that is, we still, don't have, we still haven't touched on, uh, on the idea of uh, DevOps and what, what it means to us. And uh, if we want to do that, we have solutions, right? We know uh, that the cloud is a good idea uh, to have uh, elastic uh, infrastructures that can react to failure. We know that containers are a good idea. We, we know all this and we have all these tools. Um, and that's DevOps. Yeah, that's yeah. DevOps, and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks. See you. <laughs> no, okay. Um, so wh why are we talking about this? Why is it, is it still hard? The first reason is, um, and you all know this acronym, um, SS4CP. Who knows it? 
Yeah, you're, at least you are honest because we invented it. Um, it is uh, simple solutions for complex problems. So the idea is um, we very often, and, and, and we disagree about that, we just disagreed um, uh, before the talk. My theory is that um, this gets worse in, um, in an environment uh, that runs iterative incrementally in an agile way. Because in an agile uh, solution, we try to strive for the simplest solution imaginable, we try to apply it, and then we go on. And my take on this, uh, if, if we talk about disagreeing, is that uh, agility just makes it more visible that uh, the solutions we apply are uh, sometimes too simple. In a classical waterfall, we would just have a project that ended and uh, crap is the output, and we wouldn't care. Another reason for um, um, why, why this, all this DevOps thingy, even, even though we have all the tools, is quite hard, is uh, tight coupling. So tight coupling of, uh, um, of, 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 of all different things. Um, we have dependencies between stuff, and, we, um, and, and whenever we touch something, whenever we touch one part, another part reacts, sometimes fails. This is a problem in, um, in real, uh, real life systems. Next one is specialists. Ken, in his keynote today, talked about the T-shape uh, uh, skill sets of uh, professionals. And these specialists, that would be the eye. Uh, we would have not uh, the, the bar at the top where we know uh, what the others in my team or in other teams are doing, but only our own stuff. And this makes it incredibly hard to, uh, to do complex systems uh, right, because we have handovers for everything. Uh, and no one knows uh, how everything should come together. In a similar direction um, goes uh, the brittleness. So the systems that we create, um, they usually are, um, they are targeting the happy path. So if we try to um, decompose stuff into more vertical systems, um, but we do not uh, really um, focus on how can, we make, uh, uh, how can we make them resilient so that one piece failing does not mean the whole infrastructure and the whole system failing, this creates pr uh, brittle systems. And we often in these legacy code bases accept manual, uh, manual processes, manual workarounds, someone who has, manually, uh, has to manually change configuration files on, on uh, different machines. And this makes it incredibly hard to test what we are doing. Uh, or also had to have uh, transparency on what is happening or is not happening. And when we prepared this talk and we found these five uh, areas, we thought, okay, that's a great one week training. Um, I hope you didn't plan for the rest of the week. If you did, uh, and okay, I, Michael says we only have 30 minutes. So we, we will uh, concentrate on one of these. But the question is, um, this is yes. um, th this is not this is not the problem, because we have had that for the for the last seventy years of software development. We always had specialists. We always had always had uh, brittle systems. We always had um, tight coupling and manual processes and SS4CP. Um, the reason why it becomes uh, a problem these days and why it becomes more and more of a problem is, it's overwhelming. It's not. It's not this one system that uh, has to interact with one other system. It's hundreds of very small systems that have to interact with, ma with many uh, uh, others. It's hundreds, sometimes thousands of developers working in a team of team of teams approach. Uh, it is um, more and more specialization. When I was doing my apprenticeship as a software developer or my studies as a software developer, I was going, can we say full stack? No, I didn't learn JavaScript. So, but we did. We did lots of different things um, from the database uh, uh, to the UI. And these days, you have to focus more and more because the um, the, the stuff gets more specialized every day. And now uh, <laughs> is the time to talk about. We can't talk about everything, uh, so we will concentrate on tight coupling today. We will focus on uh, tight coupling, um, and um, tight coupling is not one thing. Tight coupling comes in very many different flavors. Um, uh, Ken already, we were quite concerned uh, when Ken was speaking this morning because uh, for a short time uh, we thought that he would steal uh, parts of our talk. Um, he did not, good news. Um, because uh, uh, tight coupling comes in, in uh, for example, in architecture. We can, uh, we can uh, tightly couple um, parts of our architecture. Or our infrastructure, um, when, when we have these uh many machines and many load balancers, uh, database uh, clusters, whatever, and we have tight coupling in there, that can be a problem as well. 
and the one that um, most people understand when we talk about tight coupling, because tight coupling, the, um, um, the, the term is used mostly for source code. Mm -hmm. So in object oriented um, in an object oriented world, uh, when we talk about tight coupling, it's always about solid principles. It's about uh, low coupling, high cohesion, and stuff like that, and many many more. So tight coupling. Um, this morning, uh, Ken talked about uh, tight coupling of teams. This is also one part of tight coupling. So uh, if you need a lawyer to do your work, you are tightly coupled to the legal department, or perhaps you embed uh, a lawyer, that, that was his example. I, I don't think he mentioned tight coupling as a word, but uh, this was the same concept that uh, he was talking about. Are you and currently ma mansplaining um, Ken's talk? I think so, yes. Awesome. Uh, someone should yeah. do this. Great. <laughs> um, and, and we are going to uh, show you three, uh, for the three bullets we have there, uh, examples that are real examples from uh, our clients uh, that we worked with. Uh, so uh, though the, they are a bit simplified to fit into the time frame. But first, we would like to talk about the description of what tight coupling is, right, Oliver? It seems I'm ahead of time all, <laughs> yes. the, way, all the time. <laughs> because um, we have copied the description of tight coupling from Wikipedia, because it's quite interesting. Tight coupling, everybody talks about that, but tight coupling, to really understand it, um, tight coupling is the degree of interdependence between things. So. Um, thing A and thing B, how much and in how many different ways do they interdepend on uh, each other? So, yeah, and how, yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm too fast and I'm, uh, I'm losing my, <laughs> uh, sorry? Unprepared. Un exactly. Uh, and, but uh, we prepared uh, the definition of uh, things uh, that, we, uh, that Peter mentioned. Things can really be anything. Uh, this are, these are components in our software. Uh, these are modules, this can be machines, these can be uh, people, teams, processes, everything. And uh, this is why we have this a uh, bit broader than in the Wikipedia where, we, uh, where they only talked about software modules. Exactly. We would like to, and now we would like to go through a, a few real world examples um, that we have seen with our customers um, to just show you um, in, in what ways you can uh, work with, uh, with, with tight coupling and, um, and make your stuff more um, workable in a DevOps environment where we close more feedback loops and we try to create an environment to learn and experiment more. The first one is architecture. Um, this was in, uh, with a customer in Munich. Um, it was a, an application um, that has grown over the past um, uh, 15 years. And we had uh, one place in the system where um, we, we called it the salutation helper. Um, it was the part of uh, source code um, that I gave a user to, and it gave me the proper salutation back. So it was like um, Mr., Mrs., uh, Professor, Doctor, whomever. A very simple solution, and it was used all over the place. Not only uh, three, uh, um, th three components used it, it was in total it was a couple hundred. So we had a couple hundred uh, direct calls to this salutation helper. While we were working on the system, we had to internationalize it. So we wanted to add one, just a simple parameter to um, tell the system, give me the salutation in English, for example. And so we had to touch 500 different points. This is a very simple example of tight coupling. And, um, the way we did it, we, we wanted to go more vertical anyway, and so we uh, tried to um, refactor or restructure our salutation helper into a service. Since we do not want to have the tight coupling now between, two, between the application and the um, service, we created an event-based infrastructure in, in between, and that's the um, uh, final solution for that. And uh, for the uh, time when uh, we migrated from, uh, from the first picture to the last picture, uh, 500 instances you, you don't uh, want to and probably aren't able to switch them in uh, within one sprint or one day. Uh, but this approach, uh, you have the possibility to have the salutation helper within the monolith for the first uh, part of the transition phase. And uh, one after the, uh, the other, you move over to the broker and uh, then, in the end, you can remove the helper. Uh, when we started on this, um, I was part of one of the development teams. We had eight development teams at that customers. Um, and when we started at that, I was, um, 
I was asking my product owner if, if he was kidding me because this really refactor something that um, has exactly one method that gives me a salutation back into its own uh, microservice that does not make any sense. The good thing about that, um, we, we learned so much by migrating this very simple um, um, module into a service that from then on, every, every next service and every other service was much, much more simpler to uh, migrate and to, uh, uh, to process. And so with this, let's say, childish example um, of uh, restructuring, we set the foundation. We uh, learned so much about infrastructure, about automation, about testing. Um, that, uh, um, that we could avoid having this problematic legacy stuff that we, uh, that, we, that we have just talked about before in our new system. Next example is an infrastructure example. Uh, it was a different company that grew a bit faster than the, uh, the one we talked about. This was one of uh, Germany's biggest uh, websites uh, at the time, but it started small, so we had a MySQL database where the content was stored, this is a question and answer, platform that we're talking about, and everyone had their session, whether they are logged in and can write uh, questions and give answers uh, on the web server. Looks fine. Then our website grows, uh, our ads uh, pan out, and the web server at one point becomes full and can't handle more, uh, more sessions. So the obvious solution was, well, add a new web server, and we have a load balancer in front of this, and uh, the load balancer does sticky sessions, and uh, every request for you goes to the same web server all the time. But now, uh, while we did a obvious solution, found an obvious solution, or we thought so, we now uh, ran into the problem: what, what happens if one of the web servers goes down? And if I have five web servers, the probability does that at least one goes down is five times the probability I had before. Uh, so, so we have to deal with uh, outages more once, once we scale. And uh, now people lose their sessions and uh, can't work anymore. Also, we want to do upgrades and uh, it would be nice to leverage uh, the number of web servers we have to have uh, updates without downtimes. Here, with this tight coupling of sessions to web servers, we can't do that. And what we did there is uh, we built a new database, not a not a relational database in the MySQL that we have uh, there, but we used a memcache and put, put the session into a shared uh, and distributed uh, database that is fast, and then we could uh, move the sessions away from the web servers into the session stores, and now it doesn't matter uh, which uh, web servers uh, working on your request. Again, this is a very simple example, but an example where we learned about uh, abstracting uh, the data, uh, moving it uh, in a central location that is redundant in itself and uh, reducing uh, tight coupling. The next examples are um, uh, not tied to a specific, um, a specific customer of ours, but they're just um, examples um, uh, that we see all over the place. First one is uh, the, the classic example from a textbook. Um, you have a class foo, it depends on a class bar. Um, foo knows bar directly. Um, problem is if I want to uh, change uh, bar, I have to change foo, even though maybe it's only the implementation. Um, this in itself is no problem if only foo knows bar, but maybe another class knows bar as well. Maybe another 500 classes know bar. Um, and um, uh, having this tight coupling is uh, uh, not the best thing to go. To go. So uh, usually, and, and this is th th this is uh, um, software engineering 101, right? Um, just uh, put an interface in front of bar and um, then inject the interface using dependency inversion. That's it. Next example is. Uh a global shared value defined somewhere hard-coded. We find this all the time. Uh, <laughs> but it uh, breaks as soon as the 23 should become a 25. And even more if uh, the 25 is only valid for half of your instances. Uh, so perhaps you have to cut your uh, monolith smaller and uh, think vertical there too and have different uh, sets of configuration. Perhaps it also makes sense to have uh, some helper class or help, helper service that provides you with a configuration for the environment you are in. 
The next one um, is also a quite uh, classical example. You are depending on an external um, library. This li in, in, in this uh, uh, case, this is a, a legacy library, HTTP client. Um, you want to update to a new client, uh, to a new um, um, a library like requests. Um, problem is, if this piece of code is duplicated uh, around all your, uh, around all your uh, different um, uh, service callers, service consumers, um, you are in trouble because now you have to migrate that um, uh, all over the place. So the solution again is to, um, to put some abstraction in front of it. And this is all stuff that we learned. The problem is um, it, it grows like this over time. Because the first, the first time someone needs to use HTTP client to do it like this is perfectly fine. We just tend to forget about uh, when we should go for the abstraction. The last example that we have is um, uh, uh, it's not so obvious. Um, it's not tight coupling in code. It is tight coupling in data and in tight coupling in contracts. So imagine a web service, an old web service in, uh, um, in a SOAP web service in, with a web service definition language. Um, these uh, services are tightly coupled because the WSDL definition um, concretely defines how and what these services do. These days, we try to have services uh, co coupled in a more loosely way. We try to work with Postal's law, which uh, states that you should be very strict in what you yourself do and offer, but you should be very reluctant or you should be very allowing with everything you expect from others. Um, and uh, having a RESTful web service that is only coupled uh, via a, a URL and a simple, uh, a simple object definition is usually more easy to handle. And uh, Peter just said it uh, with the HTTP client class. The other two examples also started out very innocent. They were the obvious thing to do and the right thing to do. And over time, it, it grew to a problem. And so the solution, don't destroy it. Yes. <laughs> I, I wanted to say that the solution is uh, to go in baby steps. Um, so not one big leap for mankind, um, but uh, very small leaps for mankind. Um, because yeah. Big Bangs don't work. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a secret. We didn't want to, to spoil it, but Big Bangs does, just don't work. Uh, 70 years of software development have shown that. Even, uh, but uh, still, the reflex for every developer that has to touch code that he didn't write himself or she didn't write herself is, okay, let me do that again in two weeks and it will, it will be perfect and it never will be. Uh, it, that just doesn't work. The second thing is, um, if you are doing one baby step, there will be a next one. So you don't have to, to increase this baby step into a bigger baby step. Just, just be calm and go one step after the next. And accept that you won't be there in two weeks, in five weeks. These code bases took years to grow uh, to a bad state they, they are in right now. That it will be. Uh, it will take a lot of time uh, for them to be great again. <laughs> okay, and in, in USA, I couldn't do that. <laughs> so I think but we completely used our time box, but we would be very happy um, if we uh, uh, if we can talk about that with you. So we will be here for the happy hour. Um, Germans are always there for the happy hour. So um, if you want to approach us, we would be very happy to talk with you about these topics and more. Thanks for listening. <laughs>